Welcome to the ATA Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Baird, and you're listening to Inside Specialization, our series on the what, why, and how of specializing in a specific field of translation or interpreting. In each episode, members of ATA's Professional Development Committee will interview translation and interpreting specialists. They'll ask about what the work entails, what skills are needed, the pros and cons, and so much more. The goal is to showcase the variety of career paths in translation and interpreting and help working professionals and students understand what's out there, how they can get started, and what they need to succeed. Specialization is arguably the best way to strengthen your translation and interpreting business and stand out from the crowd. We're hoping to bring you one episode a month, and we hope you'll join us on this informative journey. This podcast is brought to you by the American Translators Association. If you'd like to know more about ATA, we'll have some information at the end of the show. All right, now over to the PD Committee and this edition of Inside Specialization. Hi, and welcome to Inside Specialization, a feature of the ATA podcast on specialization and diversification. My name is Maria Baker, and I work with the ATA Professional Development Committee. It is quite exciting to bring this series to life as a special collaboration between the ATA podcast and ATA's professional development program. In this episode, I have the pleasure of speaking to Daniel Maxson. Danielle has been uh, translating since 2009 and specializes in medical translation. Her work has included patient records, clinical trial correspondence, back translation, treatment protocols, patient education texts, pharmaceuticals, and other types of documentation. She is an ATA certified Portuguese to English and Spanish to English translator and the chair of ATA's Business Practices Education Committee. Before focusing on translation, she worked as a Spanish teacher and a healthcare interpreter. Welcome, Daniela. Pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to be here, Maria. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Okay. So um, can you expand a little bit on your background and how you got started with medical translation? Uh, Sure. It was a little roundabout. Um, As you mentioned, I was both a teacher and a healthcare interpreter before I got into translation. Right. And that's because I started learning Spanish as a child back in Texas in the 1980s. And as my kids say, when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. (laughs) And the only thing that I knew I could do with a foreign language was teach it. Although I was doing ad hoc interpreting for the staff at my high school, if Spanish speaking students needed help with somebody, nobody actually told me that interpreting or translating was a real job, except for my mother who used to work in New York City. She had once mentioned that she had a friend who worked at the United Nations as an interpreter. And to me, that sounded like the most amazing thing in the world, but I didn't see any path to get there. So after college and grad school, I started teaching Spanish. And then a couple of things happened. The first thing was that I had a baby. He was very premature and very sick. And before he could come home, he spent three months in the hospital, which means that I spent three months in the hospital visiting every day. Right, of course. And so that's that's not nearly as good as going to med school, but I saw what happens there. I saw what the doctors and nurses do. I asked them questions. I learned what was going on with my son and his medical conditions and the equipment he was using. And I saw interpreters working with other parents. So... I saw the need for language services in that setting. The second thing that happened was a few months later, a friend called me. She taught Spanish at a local college, and she also interpreted for hospitals and medical centers in the city and said they needed more interpreters. So she asked me to take their local exam and start interpreting too. This was before national certification. It was just a local test, which I passed. And so I worked as a healthcare interpreter for about a year and a half. Right. And then many kids and many years later, I started translating and I was told to specialize and that would be my best road to success. And since I had worked in medical interpreting, that seemed like a good direction to go. I had at least a little bit of a background to start from. And I knew that I would be helping people directly and that was important to me for my work. Right. So some of the path that took you here was like firsthand experience with what happens in the hospital. Right. From the patient end. Yeah. Right. Okay, thank you. So because you had this experience, um, in in your opinion, do translators who work in the medical field need to have that background to succeed or is it something that you can learn? 
Um, well, there are differing opinions. I have heard people claim that to be a good medical translator, you should be actually trained as a healthcare provider, like have gone to medical school or nursing school, for example. Um, I think that's an unrealistic standard, and I don't really recommend spending three months in the hospital being sick to, you know, get it any background. No, of but, right, but you do need some sort of training. This is not something you can try out for fun um, because your work is going to affect people's health. So you have to be able to get it right. And there are plenty of ways to learn. You need to learn the subject matter, obviously, and you need to learn about uh, the translation skills for medical translation. So, of course. Uh, there are resources out there, and you'll have to look for them, but they do exist. Some of them, are, obviously, you can buy medical textbooks, learn what the doctors are learning. Uh, for learning medical terminology, there are books on that. There are flashcard sets that teach you how medical terms are built out of parts and how to put together the prefixes and suffixes and root words to make medical terms that make sense. Um, medical transcriptionists actually have training resources that I've used that helped me learn the top terminology and learn about the types of documents you might need to be familiar with. Um, and then there's plenty on places like Coursera. They have medical schools offer classes there that you can audit. I did a course on neuroscience and learned brain anatomy that way. Um, I've done courses on clinical trials. They have some on anatomy, on immunology, all sorts of things. And of course, the normal places like YouTube has interviews with doctors, videos of surgeries. Um, there is, in the United States, there is a site called Medscape that offers professional development for doctors. There are videos, there are articles, and it has content in multiple languages. And I found similar sites in places like Brazil and um, found one in Latin America, like may, might be Mexico for Spanish language um, medical content. Right. There's... Yeah, there's all sorts of things like that, um, like medical journals. And then for the translation end of it, ATA and ProZ do have some webinars about medical translation that are good for learning about things like abbreviations, because there's a lot of that, um, different types of medical texts that you can uh, come across and how to deal with them. And I have found a few places. Uh, there's a place in Spain that offers a master's degree in English to Spanish medical translation. So you might be able to find something in the country that you're translating that language for. Right. So basically, there's no excuse. Like, uh, we have resources really. all over. <laughs> there there are a lot. Um, yeah, there is one more that I would like to mention specifically for people who are working between in English and Spanish. There is an organization in Spain called Tremedica that is made of translators who work in medicine and related fields like veterinary translation. They have a couple things. They publish a free online journal about medical translation. And they offer training workshops. Some of them are online. Some of them are in person. Early on, I attended a three-day set of workshops that they presented near me. And that I found tremendously helpful. So if you can find resources like that, then all of that will give you a good start. Right. Tremedica. I've heard about them. Um, so there's a lot that you can do, I guess, um, if you're starting or if you are already established as a medical translator, all of these resources like Coursera um, mm -hmm. would would like help you with your professional development. Yes, absolutely. And you will need to keep doing the professional development because medicine is so big. There's so much in it that you're always going to come across something that you don't know. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for that, for that very extensive list of resources. Oh, thanks. Um, now, moving on, what are some uh, typical translation assignments that you work in this area? Who are your, your typical clients? Well, um, that, that can cover a lot of ground, too. Um, my typical clients are agencies. I've done that by choice. But for people who are looking for direct clients, they can work directly for hospitals. I've done that before. Um, or clinical trial organizations, the places that run the clinical trials. Um, the sort of thing I've translated in the past, I've done patient education materials, things that will be up on a website or in a brochure handed out to a patient. Clinical trial correspondence, if doctors are writing to the organization or to the ethics committee to say, here's what's happened with us, then I've translated that. Uh, package inserts for pharmaceuticals. I've done itemized hospital bills for insurance claims. Uh, along with the message from the patient explaining, here's my bill and here's what I need you to cover. So you can get a couple different registers in the same job sometimes. I see. Yeah. Um, I also do back translation again for the clinical trials. And 
a lot of my work has been patient records. And some of those are things like handwritten notes that the doctor or the nurse is writing while they're taking care of the patient or imaging reports like an MRI of somebody's brain or a, a pregnant woman has an ultrasound to check on her baby's health. Things like right. that. There's a huge variety. Okay. Yeah, I see. So for somebody who wants to get in the field, there are a lot of possibilities, basically. <laughs> Definitely, yes. Um, and you gave me a very good segue to talk about back translation for a minute. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you tell us what is back translation or and what purpose does it serve in the medical field? Uh, sure. Yeah, if you just define the term back translation, it really sounds kind of silly. You're given a text that has already been translated, and you translate it back into its source language, which in my case is English. Uh, for medical field, specifically for clinical trials, it's used as a means to evaluate texts that have been translated, usually for patients who are being invited to participate in the trial. Those people have a right to consent freely to participate, to help to test a new drug, for example. And so they should know what is going to happen to them, what exactly will be done, what tests will be done, what the drug is supposed to do, any potential risks. There should be no hiding of any of that. So if a patient is being invited to enroll in the trial and they speak Spanish, they should be given information in Spanish that explains clearly what's going on. And one of the ways that uh, these translations are tested to make sure that they contain all the information, that they're accurate, is to have them back translated. And then if I'm given that material, I back translate it into English. And then my back translation is compared to the original English text to make sure that everything matches up. I see. So um, I had a question about like what kind of assignments you work on, but you're, I think you already answered that it's mostly <laughs> clinical trials, right? Well, what I've done is mostly clinical trials. I've heard of back translation being used for other things. Uh, maybe a medical device company just wants to check their translations of their manual for how to use the device. Right. Um, I've heard it used in other fields as well. And most of what I've done has been for the trials and it has been uh, material that will be given to the patient. But I have also been given a few documents that are meant for the team doing the research. Um, mm -hmm. For example, the pharmacy that will handle the trial medication. Sometimes I've been asked to translate the instructions for them. Right. Okay. So there is some wiggle room there too. There's there's some variation in what you can do when, with back translation. Yes. Um, do you think that there are any special skills required to be able to work in back translation? Uh, a couple. I mean, first of all, there's all the basic stuff. We all need an excellent understanding of both the source and the target language, obviously. You need to understand the subject matter. But back translation has different rules than a regular translation that you need to be careful about. Um, because you're helping to evaluate someone else's work, back translators are often told to translate literally which means no cleaning it up, no correcting spelling errors, no changing passive voice to active voice because that would sound better in English. Oh you my God. To, you need to really hold yourself very carefully to what is actually on the page. Sounds like and you need a lot of attention to detail. Very careful attention to detail. The sort of thing that a copy editor or a proofreader would do if you're publishing a book, for example, you need to be very careful about all of it. Point out any errors in four languages with um, gendered nouns. For example, if the noun and the adjective aren't matching up for some reason, if there was a typo there, you need to point that out. But you also need to do it diplomatically because there is somebody on the other end of that whose work is being judged. And if your translation does not match up with the source text, you might be asked to update it. Your translation will be critiqued. So you also need to be able to take criticism gracefully. Okay, that's very important. I mean, that's always important, but I guess particularly mm -hmm. in this case, um, to go to the, I'm, I'm going to go to the topic that we're all talking about. Okay. Uh, artificial intelligence and machine translation. Do right. you think that it's impacting translation and back translation, particularly like in the medical field? Are we, are we going to do mostly post-editing anytime soon? Um, there are certainly people who are doing post-editing. And I've heard about people who are working with AI applications for medical work. I don't have a lot of personal experience with that, but I think it depends on what smaller area you're drawn to in the world of medical translation. Because as we've talked about, there's a lot of room here. And there are people who are doing um, MT for some applications, but the two specializations that I work with specifically don't really lend themselves to that. Right. For a back translation, if you're helping to evaluate somebody else's work, you don't want to just stick that into a computer and expect the computer to know. 
And for the patient records, like I said, I get PDFs that are scans of photocopied handwritten notes. Yeah. And doctor handwriting is illegible no matter what language they're writing in, really. <laughs> and MT is not going to work for that. It just can't do it. You really need human eyes on that. Yeah, um, I agree. I feel like um, artificial intelligence is getting better all the time, but there are places, like you said, where it can't quite reach or work. Yeah. Um, for the people who are beginning and getting into the field, imagine that you could go back in time and give yourself some advice when you were starting. What advice would you give yourself? Oh, wow. I think the first thing I would say would be to learn as much as you can, as often as you can, and to try to find other people who are doing the same work so that you can bounce ideas off of them. You'll have somebody to ask questions of, and don't be afraid to ask those questions. I, because again, we're dealing with patient's health and you don't want to get it wrong and possibly cause harm to another human being. Um, I would also say, try not to be squeamish. This sounds a little silly, but some of the things that can happen to the human body are not very nice. And you might be looking at pictures as you're doing research. You might be watching videos of surgeries to learn how some things are happening. And you kind of need a strong stomach for that sometimes. And the last thing I would say, just to be proud that you're going to do work that will help people to stay healthy. Absolutely. So your work really matters yes. in that way. I mean, every work matters, but we have a special, in the medical field, we have that special satisfaction of feeling we make a difference in someone's um, healthcare, treatment, et cetera. Yes, absolutely. And I find that very exciting and very rewarding. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, this has been fantastic. Thank you for spending this time with me and sharing your experience with us. I hope that our listeners enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Maria. It's been a pleasure to be talking with you today. All right. We'll see you next time. Thank you. You've been listening to Inside Specialization, our series on the what, why, and how of specializing in a specific field of translation or interpreting. Big thanks to everyone involved in the production of this episode. ATA's PD committee developed and coordinated the interview. Mixing and editing was done by Derek Platts. Mary David and Rashan Pacarell at ATA headquarters provided editorial and technical support. Now, if you learned anything new in today's podcast, I bet there's somebody out there who would like to know it too. Don't be stingy. Tell them about us. I've gotten to know so many great podcasts that way. I promise they'll thank you for it. And if you're not an ATA member, listen up. I've been a member for over 20 years. I can honestly say that ATA launched my freelance career and I've never looked back. Nowadays, the demand for translators and interpreters is at an all time high, but finding quality work isn't easy. ATA membership can make a difference. And ATA isn't just for translators or interpreters. Individuals, companies, and organizations can become members. We have teachers, professors, hospital administrators, language company owners, technology developers, as well as language companies, universities, hospitals, and government agencies. Go to ATA's website, atanet.org, for details. Or check out past episodes of this podcast where we talk about the benefits of membership and what's currently happening in the association. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Talk to you again soon.